let's uh, get started. New units. So we've, um, we're finally out of the kind of evolutionary stuff, although I think that we'll see that there's a lot of these types of things have kind of a fitness component to them. So the way in which these evolutionary algorithms have this sort of iterative way of, of comparing where we've been and where we're going to be um, is going to, we're going to see that in other things, but these are not explicitly evolutionary anymore. And so we're at uh, some simulated annealing for a lecture or two, and then we'll flip over to what I call distributed uh, artificial intelligence. And so in those cases, or otherwise known as swarm intelligence, and that's where we'll start talking about things like ant colony optimization and some other things like that, which should get a little bit more multi-agent, where we put agency, as opposed to individuals that are just sort of assessed and then moved around by selective pressure, then the agents sort of take on um, a little bit more decision-making ability in themselves, and then you kind of ask those agents to then collectively come up with decisions, and that's kind of the difference between, like, a swarm intelligence and these kind of evolutionary intelligence. But before we get there, um, a, you know, simulated annealing. So this is a, an algorithm that was inspired by nature, uh, but it is, uh, but it's not anything biological. So that's one of the sort of the big differences here. And it originally didn't start as an optimization algorithm. So um, how many people here are familiar with uh, MCMC methods? Or, okay, so a few, so these, uh, what does MCMC stand for, anybody? Markov chain Monte Carlo, right. So this simulated annealing was effectively born out of the first MCMC algorithm. So, so, but we'll, so we'll get into that. So this uh, annealing word here, you know, we can first kind of ask, you know, what is annealing? And so um, annealing basically uh, you can take a material, a big chunk of material, and it has a bunch of impurities in it. And so you can heat it up to a point uh, where it will recrystallize. So it starts, um, you know, it gains a little bit more of this, this natural malleability, and then cool it down. And so if you cool it down quickly, then if it had any impurities after you heat it up, you cool it back down, it's still going to have those impurities. But the idea is if you heat a material up, and uh, then you start allowing it to flow a little bit and then you cool it slowly, then these impurities can be viewed as a tension in the material, like they're high energy states. And so ideally, if the material had a way, it would want to get rid of these states. It would want to settle out into lower energy states with less tension. So that's what you're trying to do is when you heat a, a material up to the point where it, 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 it um, softens, then, so I can say that again, heat to recrystallization, then the idea is you free material to move to lower energy configuration. given enough time. So, you know, as a very simple case, you'd imagine if you have an ice cube that is, um, you know, in the shape of this chair, that is sort of a very strange configuration for water to be in, but it's all frozen up in that ice cube. Now, if I could heat it very quickly and then cool it very quickly, I mean, it probably wouldn't look like a chair, but if I could cool it fast enough, it would still um, would end up being in some funny shape. If I could catch it in sort of that funny shape, but it still would be kind of not in the, the state that it wants to be in. But if I heat that ice cube up that's in the shape of this chair so that it's liquid again, then that allows it to settle out flat, and, uh, and, and you know maybe it's, if it's in a kiddie pool or something like that, and sort of fill the kiddie pool uniformly, and then if I slowly cool that down and freeze it out, then I get a nice smooth surface that I can maybe ice skate on or something like that. So you can't ice skate on a uh, chair-shaped ice rink, but you can ice skate on a kiddie pool-shaped ice rink. So that's the idea behind a, a, a kneeling, yeah. So why is the ice rink lower energy? 
than the chair chooses? Well, the, so that's a good question. So what we mean by uh, lower energy is that there's, well, I mean, so in this particular case, it's a gravitational thing. And so there's, you know, this chair is, it is sort of, you know, if we came back here in a million years, this chair would eventually kind of weather away and be rubble, and all that rubble will be on the ground. Almost like the entropy principle. It is exactly the entropy principle. So this, yeah, the second law. So right now, um, to a physicist, it's really hard to talk to physicists because you say words like equilibrium um, to them. To, to a physicist, everything around you is out of equilibrium. This chair is out of equilibrium. I'd say, well, it looks pretty much like the equilibrium to me. It's not moving anywhere, right? But to a physicist, this chair is on its way to the heat death of the universe. And um, it is just in this transient, you know, quasi-stable state, but it will eventually break down. And so, but uh, it is breaking down very, very slowly. And occasionally, as it breaks down, we fix it. And so we borrow energy from some other part of the world, we create more entropy in that other part of the world by doing that, and then we reduce the entropy in the chair. So that's kind of the way a physicist views the world. Um, even though nobody else does. But, uh, so that chair to you looks like it's, it's pretty stable, but to a physicist it's not. And this is sort of a similar thing here, where uh, you can have materials that are kind of bound up in a local, a locally stable uh, uh, spot, and we're heating them to sort of make it quicker so that they can move, they can end up binding. Now you need a little bit of noise because they really could just be locally clear. It might really be that there is an energetic barrier that prevents you to get from one state to another. And so it's not enough to provide mobility. You have to provide mobility and a little bit of thermal energy to get over these barriers. And uh, that's how we view, for example, stochastic gradient descent works with uh, neural networks, is that there are a bunch of local equilibria you can get stuck at, but if you add a little bit of noise, then you smoothly glide over all of those and hopefully find the best weights that minimize that loss function. So it's a sort of a similar idea here. So that if we cool slowly, then the hope is that we will eventually get a more defect-free, so a more energetically favorable configuration. So we say hope is a more defect-free configuration. And so this process happens at room temperature, but very slowly. And so this uh, you know, more defect-free configuration we could also view as a lower energy configuration. So pictorially, then you can kind of see the optimization picture here. You have some landscape of configurations and you have some energy level and you can think of this energy level as a type of potential energy. So it is the amount of work you could potentially do or, uh, if, or the amount of work that went into putting those things in that configuration. And so if they were to then descend into some other configuration, they would give off some energy. And so, um, so you could imagine some landscape that might kind of look like this and you could get stuck in, so you, you like these here, this is, might be irregularities, um, inhomogeneity, uh, inhomogeneities, et cetera. And then this here is the kind of, um, you know, smooth, symmetric, low energy state. And so nature doesn't like these asymmetries because it kind of says that one, you know, it's like you, you have a bathtub and it happens to be the one end of the bathtub is a little higher than the other. Um, 
then you, that suddenly makes one in the bathtub more special than the other. And nature doesn't really like that because how can you justify the one in the bathtub is more special than the other if they both are the same height away from the earth? And so, uh, so that is a higher energy configuration. You're being held away from the symmetric state. And that's another way of saying that that is a lower entropy because um, lower entropy means there's more asymmetry. And so as you go towards higher entropy, you're going towards more symmetry. And that's ideally here. So the, thing, the, the thought in simulated annealing was that, well, if there is a physical process that already does this, where you heat a chair up and the chair is stuck in this chair local equilibria, and it might eventually find its way down through here just by the little thermal energy that's in the room. Uh, but uh, we want to speed this process up, so we're going to heat this thing up so it has a lot more energy. Then it will then more quickly find its way down here, and then hopefully we can catch it down here by cooling it off, and then it'll get stuck in this state, which is like just you know pieces of chair strewn haphazardly around. And so can we somehow substitute the energetic function that's in real life with an optimization function that we're interested in? And we use the optimization function as a way to sort of add in uh, as a representation of our energetic, you know, what states. So you could be at a local optima here, but there's this global optima down here that's going to be better. And the way simulated annealing would reflect it as better, it would be at a lower energy state. So we'd like to build a simulation of annealing that causes our decision variables to kind of go downhill in this energetic landscape. So how do we add thermal energy where the thermal energy is representing kind of the noise along this, uh, this landscape, which will be our optimization function. So that's where we're heading. That's the basic insight behind simulated annealing. But in order to get there, uh, there were a, a bunch of other, so I like to go to talk about the path of discovery. So simulated annealing, you know, I think the paper on simulated annealing came out in like science or nature in like 81 or 82. So it's, it's not that old, um, but the, the, the really what it was built on came out much, much earlier than that for a different purpose. It actually was to simulate um, actually the physical system. So they weren't interested in optimization functions, they were interested in doing physics and understanding real matter. So how many people have heard of the Metropolis algorithm or the Metropolis Hastings algorithm? So about the same people who probably heard of MCMC. So this, this Nicholas Metropolis enters the stage in 1953. Um, so this is a larger team So this metropolis algorithm, I think a lot of people don't know where the name comes from because it sounds like it has something to do with like a city or something, but sadly it's just somebody's last name. And, um, and so um, this is, you know, and just to give some context, 1953, computer science in 1953. So all of you have probably taken some form of numerical methods or simulation course where you've learned about random number generators and different ways you can generate random numbers. And um, back in 1953, and I bring this up because the Metropolis algorithm uses a lot of random numbers, they were still using what's known as the middle squared method to, to generate random numbers, which is basically this idea that you take like a four digit number, um, and this isn't important for the class, but you take some four digit number and you take the middle two digits out of it, square them, and then that generates a new uh, middle, a, a new four digit number, and then you can keep doing that, and you can kind of use the digits of this number as your random number for, for generating these random numbers. And it turns out this was just a terrible random number generator. It was really difficult to find seeds that this would generate a long string of apparently independent numbers, but it was the best that they got. So it's, um, so this is, you know, this, and actually random number generation was driven by actually the project to uh, the Manhattan Project. So another city name, but in that case, I think truly a, a city, and where, where they needed to study the physics of nuclear energy using uh, simulation uh, methods, using Monte Carlo sampling. And so the term Monte Carlo was a code name for these methods. 
because they needed to be able to talk about them because it was top secret at the time. And so they thought, well, there's a casino. Casinos are all about randomness. So we're going to name Monte Carlo. So that's the realm where this is like the very, like this is people are just starting to learn how to use randomness. You know, so uh, before that, it was like a totally deterministic world in, co in computing. And so Metropolis uh, publishes this paper in the Journal of Chemical Physics. And again, it had nothing to do with optimization. It was, uh, the, I think the paper was something like equations of state calculations by fast computing machines. So basically, Metropolis and co-authors were inspired by the fact that using these Monte Carlo methods to investigate things, again, uh, at that time primarily in, in nuclear energy, and uh, they said, wow, you know, you can use these computers that can generate these random numbers, and maybe we can use them to try to make guesses at how physical matter will should behave under different conditions. And so they were particularly interested in at equilibrium, How do we describe the state of a system? And so this is an, one example of the state of a system. So, but you could imagine if we think about a piece of material, uh, you could say, you know, if we focus on, you know, where are the, uh, where are the molecules of material, where are the atoms in a crystal lattice located, those sorts of things. So that's really what they're sort of talking about is that uh, if I have a particular material that starts in one state and I just let it uh, sit in that state for a long enough period of time, then where are, say, dopants in a semiconductor going to relocate over time? And, um, and so how can I use a computer to simulate this process? So if I run the computer for long enough, and then I sample wherever those atoms are in the simulated material, I'll have pretty good confidence that those atoms will be in a place that is very reasonable for what the real material would be. So um, this is uh, using the notion of this um, canonical ensemble from statistical mechanics. And this is just basically uh, represents the um, statistical ensemble of all possible states a system can be in. And so the goal here is to give me a probability distribution across states at equilibrium. So the idea being is that all of the particles of uh, molecules of air in this room, after I shut that door and if this is a totally sealed room, then there might be certain macroscopic heterogeneities. You might get more, you know, a, a higher density of air here and a lower density of air here, but over time, the average density uh, across the whole room would be flat, uh, but individual uh, molecules of air would constantly be moving still. So if I want to do like a probability distribution on the microscopic states of all the particles in this room, then I have to sort of understand that there are certain configurations where molecules near the door, uh, where some molecules are near the door, some molecules are near the whiteboard, others where we flip that but the idea being is that there's a uniform distribution over those two uh, states. So as long as um, I have a sort of an equal probability that there's, uh, you know, that, that basically th there's a bunch of different ways to say I'm gonna have a uniform density of air uh, across this room. Um, but in each one of those ways to say, all of the different ways in which that could happen, I would call a microstate. And so there is a distribution of microstates on which we 
we want to sort of understand like which microstates are more likely than others and which microstates are sort of equally likely. So the microstate of the world where all of the air in the room is in that corner and the rest of the room is a vacuum is very, very unlikely. And that uh, we would refer to as a very low entropy state uh, because there's a high order. We know where everything is, it's all over there. But the, when we've got uniform density all throughout the, the room, then we are at a so-called high entropy state. And it's high entropy because uh, it would be, I, I kind of, um, there, it's very hard to tell it apart from there's a wide range of ways to have air all throughout the room. I mean, again, I could just take these molecules and these molecules, swap them, and couldn't tell the difference. So the fact that it is very difficult for me to tell from one microstate to another, then I have a high entropy state. But if it's everything, if there's only really one way to do it, and you can tell it very differently away from all the other ways to do it, I have a low entropy state. So things move from low entropy to high entropy. And we want to sort of understand what are those equilibrium distributions. So it's easy to guess for a room like this, but for a piece of chalk or uh, a semiconductor, then how do we understand how things move around within that piece of material? And that is what they were trying to solve with computers back in the 50s. Yeah. It just, uh, I think I'm following what you're saying. You're saying you can also view that as like the amount of energy vessels it takes to reach that state. So like if all the air in that part of everything else evacuates, it would take a high investment, whereas a fairly uniform distribution of air across the room is low investment. Well, we have to, we have to be careful about, um, uh, so I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but there is a difference between um, energy and entropy, and there's this term free energy which sort of explains that difference. And so, I mean, it's like, um, so right now, you know, there's molecules of air that are constantly churning in this room, but we can't really, but there's never gonna be a consistent flow. And so there's actually no free energy in this room, at least in terms of the air, because I can't like drive a windmill with it. Now, if I managed to put all of the air in the room up into a corner, then I'm pretty sure that statistically speaking, it is gonna be unlikely for the air to stay in that corner because when it moves, it's very likely, it, well, it, up in that corner, it's equally likely for air to go in either direction. But once air is moved away, it is unlikely that all of the air will end up going back to where it was. And so, that's, uh, so that is what sort of sets up the second law of thermodynamics that causes all the air in that corner to spread through the room. So I could put a windmill here, after I pushed it up there, and then it would run that windmill. And so you'd say, oh wow, but I just got energy out of that. Well, this is where your, what you sort of said came in. In order for me to run that windmill, I had to first yeah. vacuum up all of the air and put it up into that corner. And then statistically speaking, as it diffuses through the room and comes back to uniformity, that flow that ends up generating re re reflected the, uh, the battery that I've turned the room into by pushing everything up there. And so, if you're interested in these topics, I would look up the differences and similarities between the terms entropy, energy, and free energy. And the free energy is kind of the important thing, so. All right, so, um, so just trying to make this a little more concrete. Um, there is sort of an interesting, so like along those lines, a closed system can move from one state to another without losing or gaining energy. Energy is conserved. So, um, but we know by the second law of thermodynamics is, is that entropy tends to increase. So again, there's this term entropy I keep mentioning, and basically uh, entropy, just kind of without getting too much into stat mech, if you had a uh, probability, if you have all these states of the world, which I'll say, let's say X is a microstate. So this is like where all, if I made this like a vector, you can imagine this to be where all air molecules are. And then you can imagine that I have a probability distribution, which um, let's just say I call it F of uh, X, and this is a probability distribution or a probability density function over microstates, then I can define this integral, which is a type of expectation, which is just uh, going to be the, I'll just do the log, I'll just print these around that. And so this integral of f log f, 
um, is what we define as this thing called entropy. And um, so, uh, which I might call S. Shannon. Uh, well, it is related to Shannon entropy. It turns out that uh, Shannon entropy is the application of this idea to information. So, for example, I could say something with high entropy um, is something that in order for me to communicate to you, I need a, mi a lot of bits to communicate to you. Something with low entropy, in order for me to communicate to you, I need a few number of bits. For example, if all of the particles of air were collapsed into an infinitesimal point, there would be no, like, no entropy there. Um, and so I could communicate to you all of them, the, you know, I could communicate to you the microstate of the room just by communicating a single point in the room. So it's very low information. But if uh, I wanted to communicate to you the position of every particle of air and their spread uniformly throughout the room, I have to give you individual coordinates for every single molecule of air. And I, there's, no, there's no optimization there. I have to give you every single coordinate. So high entropy states are ones where I have to specify lots and lots of information to communicate. Low entropy states are ones where there's so much kind of degeneracy in the system that I can compress the description. So there is a, a very tight relationship between these things. Now, uh, there's the second law of thermodynamics. Which basically says that um, the change in entropy over time is greater than or equal to zero, at least at the, the kind of observable scales. And all this is saying is it sounds you know, magical or something, but it's just a statistical statement. It's a statistical statement of certainty. It's this idea that if, I, if, if I'm in a room and I have a bunch of things clustered in one area, um, and I know that, that these, these particles can exchange uh, positions, for example, um, so these two might swap positions, uh, or the, the two beneath them might swap positions. All of those things are admissible, or um, I could have a particle move into a different area, a different part of the room. Now, this particle that's in this part of the room, if I say that it can move in all four directions, it's going to be more likely that it's going to create more dispersion than less dispersion. So if you start in a less dispersed way, there's no like gravity that's pulling things into here. There's no pressure. There's no real pressure or anything like that. It's just every particle can move in one of, say, four different directions. And so when you start them up here, if every particle can move uniformly in any direction, it's just more likely that you're going to get a more and more dispersed uh, group over time. Because it is very, un like, and once one of them's moved away, like it had a bunch of different ways that it could have moved away. Once it's moved away, there's only like one way to get back into this position, but there's a bunch more ways to get even farther away. So it's just a statistical certainty that you move from a so-called highly ordered states to less ordered states. And, um, and it turns out that when you uh, impose rectangular constraints, then the maximum entropy distribution is uniform. So with rectangular constraints, then the maximum entropy distribution is uniform. So spread all throughout this, which basically means, and that makes a lot of sense, because once you have particles everywhere throughout this rectangle, at this point, if they all move uniformly in any direction, they're just going to swap with other particles, and I'm not going to be able to tell the difference. So if these two particles in the middle swap positions, it looks exactly the way it did before. And so once the distribution has become uniform, then the fact that they all move uniformly doesn't change. I've, I've reached equilibrium from a thermodynamic point of view. When you add gravity into things, the max entropy distribution changes a little bit. And now everything's a ball. So that's the reason why things cluster into planets at the scale where gravity matters. When gravity doesn't matter, things spread out. And it all comes down to this basically you know, statistical certainty. How many people study natural or have done any work in natural language processing, NLP? A handful. Um, so the NLP folks were inspired by this. And they started using what now is being used in a bunch of other fields called Maxint. 
So you can find a bunch of APIs for max int. How many people are familiar with or have heard of max int, maximum entropy? So the idea behind max int is you could provide constraints other than rectangular constraints. And then you ask, what is the maximum entropy distribution under those other constraints? I mentioned to you, if you add gravity, the maximum entropy distribution is not uniform anymore. So the idea here was, uh, well, if I'm trying to complete, like I've got a sentence full of a bunch of words, you know, the, the quick brown fox jumped over the blank. Well, the, you know, you could imagine that um, if I don't have any words in front of it, you could say, well, what's the next word? You know, you could play that game. You know, you could you know, have, ask Google to autocomplete nothing. And that is just going to be a uniform distribution of words from the English language. Maybe not even from the English language. But the instant I add one word, I've now added a constraint, like gravity. And that shapes the distribution of things that can follow. And then I add another one, and that shapes the distribution of things that I can follow. And so the more and more constraints change the maximum entropy distribution. And we claim that the, now you could pick any distribution. So you could say the quick brown fox, fox jumps over the, and then you could say, well, I could, there's a bunch of distributions of words I could choose there. Which is the right distribution to choose? And you want to choose the one so-called with the least bias. And so the idea behind, you know, so I could say, well, uh, I come up with some heuristic, and I, you know, I mine the dictionary for words that have the same number of vowels as all the words that came before it. That doesn't make much sense, but that would come up with a distribution of words based on the previous words. But we would think that that's somehow going to bias things in a way that doesn't really make sense. So what the NLP people just said is they said, you know what, those of us who remember our StatMec, we used to make computer scientists take StatMec. Um, those of us who remember StatMec remember that if you imposed constraints on a system, it would change the maximum entropy distribution. And that's really all we're doing. And the maximum entropy distribution somehow is the least biased guess of where things should be. And so in the NLP case, they said, rather than us coming up with some stupid heuristics on the next word, let's figure out how to solve the maximum entropy math problem, which is a math problem. And um, in this max entropy math problem, we're gonna solve it subject to the constraint on the discrete set of words we've been given. And the thought is that the distribution, the probability mass function across all possible words will somehow be the least biased guess of the next word that comes, the most honest guess of the next word that comes. Now people are using maxint for forensics, for ecology, for anthropology. You can go down to South America and you can dig up an artifact in a particular area, say, uh, you know, in the middle of the rainforest, and you dig up a couple other artifacts, and then you say, all right, I found artifacts in these places. I know there's a river here. I know there's certain places that are inhabitable for, or that, that cannot be, that are not habitable for humans here. I'm adding all these constraints. Given the data of where I found things and where all these constraints are, where should I sample next? And, and this has been used to actually find whole new civilizations that have not been touched by uh, society, is that by people saying, I've got a whole bunch of rainforest to search for, I don't know where to search next. And it's exactly the same problem that NLP people were focusing on, is what's the next word I should choose? So what's the next search location I should choose based on the data that I found? And they use maxing for that. So it's so widely used, you can go into R, you can go into Python, and there's just libraries out there, and you basically specify the data you have and the constraints you have, and it will give you a distribution on the next samples uh, that were likely to come, and that sort of tells you maybe where you should uh, bias your search. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's all based on this entropy formula up top. Right, well, so the thought is that, so this formula was dreamed up by people like Maxwell, um, trying to mimic the physical reality that there are going to be some distributions that are going to be more likely from physical processes than others. And so it's not like pulled out of nowhere. This, the thought was that he was trying to formulate this problem that it seems like uniformity is special. Is there a way in which we could predict uniformity given these constraints? And it turns out that that's the right expression to do. Doesn't like that problem you described, the 
search area for anthropology doesn't that require a whole lot of domain expertise to classify the difference? It won't just be a simple here's this mathematical formula for predict all these human environmental factors. Like no, it's, it, it's effectively just a different spin on a Bayesian inference or a Bayesian inference. So the idea would be that, yeah, if I, the more domain knowledge I get, the better my predictions will be. But I think choosing uniformity is a bad idea. So uniform, a uniform search would actually be a biased search in that case. It's like, you know, your own personal biases tell you you should be uniform. But the maxim, to try, it's just like Pareto optimality. It's trying to remove the subjectivity to sort of say objectively, based on all the info that you know enough of that you can write down on paper, that it would be a bad choice or a very unlikely choice for you to search over here. And, um, and so that's what the maxim is, just trying to give you a way to, to guide your search based on the info you have. And yeah, you can think of it, um, in fact, I think you can find um, ways in which you can rethink you can frame these two things together. Yeah. Uh, just, just to clarify, this entropy formula that you said over here is what we would use for simulated entropy. We'll get to well, yeah. So, yeah, what, th this will pop up in simulated annealing. Simulated annealing is effectively using an entropy-based approach in order to do its searching. We will get to that though. Uh, I think I saw your question first. Quick, quick plan on my. Well, uh, I mean, so this is, I mean, uh, the, you have an entropy of a distribution. And so the, um, the entropy is defined not over points, but over distributions. So I guess that when I think of a loss function, a loss function is usually defined over like a vector. Um, I could say like, how, how bad is this vector corresponding to some objective? It's point-wise. Whereas entropy is a property of distributions, just like an average is a property of distributions. In fact, the entropy, um, can be written as the, I mean, well, it's effectively the expectation of the log of f of x, if you think about it. So it is, um, so this, yeah, so it's, it's defined over distribution, not points. So that's, I think, the big difference. And there's a whole, if you're interested in this stuff, then, um, you know, this all, this applied to computing all falls under, of course, the, the, um, the area of information theory, on which you can find, um, there's some people in this building that are interested in info theory, there's a couple of um, electrical engineering courses that are interested in info, info theory, or uh, you can, um, the Thomas and Cover, I think Cover and Thomas, one of those, that's kind of the standard book on info theory that if the, so of course you can go and read Shannon's book, but the textbook that we all use when we teach this stuff is the Thomas and Cover, Cover and Thomas, I forget which one, it's a red book, um, and so that's like where you learn about, you know, entropy, mutual entropy, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And so very interesting frameworks for thinking about distribution. All right, so distribution. So um, this is kind of giving you a flavor of what this max int is. And so I want to get, you know, as we get more and more to the physical uh, uh, idea here. So I'm interested in the distribution of energy. So I am interested in sort of knowing, um, you know, what is the distribution of energy across particles, let's say, given that the sum, oh that do the sum of let's say the energy across is constant. So you imagine that uh, there's a molecule here, it's really energetic, it's moving around a lot, there's a molecule here, it's stationary, and they bump into each other, they trade energy, but there's a conservation of energy. So as long as I'm in, truly in a sealed box, then uh, no energy is coming out of the box, no energy is coming in the box, so the view of this is a closed system. And so this is a different type of constraint. So I mentioned that I have, you know, rectangular, the position of particles in a box 
That is, I am a spatial constraint. No particles can be farther than that wall or farther than that wall. They've got to be in between it. What's the maximum entropy configuration of positions? For an energy conservation, which is what we have inside a, a piece of material that's just sitting on a table, then, uh, then we need to ask inside it, though we know that the microstates uh, aren't gaining any energy or losing any energy, or we're just assuming they're not losing any energy. So given that the sum, but we know that, that they're trading energy internally. So I'm saying, what's the distribution of energy across the particles within the object and um, under this constraint here? So I want to solve the, you know, what is the distribution that is the maximum entropy distribution? And so this is actually a fun little homework problem if you take a calculus of variations class. Um, and, um, and you know, it basically, I'm not going to go through it, but you, but it's basically this idea that, um, you know, how do I maximize this um, integral of f log f um, subject to the constraint that um, all of my, that the, the energetics so this, is a, so this is a distribution of energy. So I've got the, the subject to the constraint that, the, um, that, the, that all of these microstates in this distribution um, have to add up to the, uh, well, I'll say subject to the expected value of f is equal to constant. We'll say that. Or the expected value f of the x's that are in there, so this is green. So I've got some distribution of energetic states, and the, so the mean value of this is going to be equal to constant. So all of the possible configurations have to have a certain given constant. So find the, the maximize over a distribution, and that's what makes this the calculus of variation problem. I'm finding the distribution that maximizes the entropy over all distributions that have the same mean. And I might also um, say that, well, maybe I'm also going to say that the support is uh, strictly uh, non-negative because it's energy. So these are my two constraints, that um, I, I have to have distributions that have strictly non-negative support. They're only defined for these numbers. And the mean is a given value. And so I am trying to find the distribution, the max distribution, subject to these constraints. And the solution to this problem, if you do a little CV here, is the so-called Boltzmann distribution, which should look familiar. So the Boltzmann distribution is a distribution, um, I'll say F of, and I'll say E for energetic states, that is proportional to an exponential. In other words, a Boltzmann distribution is an exponential. And so how many people know what a Poisson process is? Okay, so a Poisson process, a Poisson point process, if you were to, we know that uh, if I were to sort of uh, say that, okay, encounters to a store are driven by a Poisson process, then that means that the time in between encounters is exponentially distributed. So if I were to sort those encounters from let's say some early time to some later time, then I would get a bunch of encounters whose each one of these things would be exponentially distributed. So the, the inter-arrival times would be exponentially distributed. So the distribution of space between the dots would be exponentially distributed, although the points themselves would be uniformly distributed from zero to t. Well, this is exactly what's going on inside the molecules of air in this room, is that the molecules are distributing themselves uniformly throughout the room, their energy has to add up to whatever value it was in, in when I closed that door. So this, this here is me saying, like in the Poisson process, this is me saying that the arrival rate is known and constant. So the arrival rate is a given. So a Poisson process is actually the result of maximum entropy on this. Is that somebody said, I need to model something, and all I know is that the time in between uh, arrivals is non-zero, and I know that the rate is given. And I know that all of the interarrivals have to add up to capital T. Um, 
And so all of that together is exactly the same problem that the physicists are trying to do here. And the Poisson process, the Poisson point process, is yet another example of how max int has been used to build models that are the least unbiased models. If all you know is that the interarrival times are positive, and all you know is that the interarrival times have a rate that's given, then you should pick a Poisson process. The same way that if physicists, if all they know is that energy is conserved, and all they know is that energy is non-negative, then they should assume that those particles are going to have a distribution of energy that is exponential. So those two things link together. Now, the physicists don't like to call it an exponential distribution. They like to call it a Boltzmann distribution or a Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution. So, and maybe those of you in machine learning have learned about Boltzmann machines and all that sort of stuff, so all relates to this stuff. Now, in order for this proportionality to get rid of that, to actually define what this really is, I need to normalize it so the area underneath the distribution is one, and that's the so-called partition function. So if you talk to physicists, they get all excited about partition functions and all that. You wonder, what, what, what do you mean partition function? It's just a normalization constant for their exponential distribution. So the actual maximum entropy distribution so I'll call this um, if I were to call this EI, for example, and then I could say this is EJ over KT, and this is over all J, then this thing in the bottom here is a so-called partition function, sometimes written as Z. And so this partition function is basically just taking the contribution to probability density from all of the other energetic states that a particle could be in. So a particle could have a lot of energy, a particle could have a little energy, um, but we know that it should uh, be according to an exponential distribution, so we have to normalize in order to, for the area underneath the distribution to be equal to one, and this is their normalization constant. So if you like the Poisson process stuff, if you like, uh, you, this is like under uh, like a merged Poisson process, this is like adding up all the rates or something, there's all sorts of analogies you can make. But this term, if you ever hear physicists say partition function, all they mean is constant that normalizes my probability distribution. That's what a partition function is. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just did not get uh, the relationship that you were talking about the early days and choosing a Poisson distribution. Uh, so with, uh, with the Poisson distribution, I say that my arrival rate is, um, is given is, uh, so I basically say the mean inter-arrival time is equal to one over lambda. So my inter-arrival rate is equal to lambda. And so if I know that all of my inter-arrival times, so I'll call this inter-arrival, maybe I'll call it IAT, inter-arrival time. If I know that all of the inter-arrival times are greater than zero, and I know that the mean is one over lambda, Knowing that the mean is fixed is effectively um, similar to, it's related to saying that, the, that regardless of how you draw these, they all have to add up to the same number. So if I know that I'm, I'm waiting an hour um, and my inter-arrival time is five per hour, then that means that when I add up all these inter-arrival times, they all have to add up to roughly an hour, plus or minus just a tiny bit, but it's basically, you know, I'm gonna get five per hour. So, um, so that saying that you know the mean interarrival time is equivalent to saying I know that all my interarrival times have to add up to a constant. And so the maximum entry distribution of interarrival times happens to be an exponential distribution. Not because somebody thought that an exponential just looked like the data. It's because they said that what's the least unbiased way I can draw interarrival times given that all I know is I get roughly five arrivals per hour. And they use the max int formula, which is this Thing, and they came up with an exponential, which is exactly what the physicists did when they came up with the Boltzmann distribution. Yeah. In, in the last equation, f of e i, uh, does i indicate the, the form of uh, each particle in all the energy or the microstates of the, the all the distribution? Um, so in this expression here, 
Um, I'm saying that um, you could view this as the energy, the energy of the configuration. So this chair is in one particular energy, and um, and so um, that's one way to view it. Or, or the other way to view it in this particle situation, I would view this as the energy of an individual particle. Yeah. Yeah. I think I just got lost somewhere, but the arrival of changes is exponential. The arrival of change. Sorry. So the, the arrival of like changes of the you know, like you're talking about the air in the in the room, and you're like the talking about the changes in the states of the air in the room? I just don't, I'm not understanding what's arriving in terms of... Oh, well, I was saying that, that if you're familiar with the Poisson process, that all of this, that as an analogy, this is sort of a separate thing, that all of this math is also where this Poisson process stuff came from. And so, just like it, so don't, don't worry about particles in the room, but worry about arrivals to the room. And so if all I know is that consistently over an hour, I, during this particular slice of day, I got five arrivals per hour, and I want to simulate arrivals to this room, then what's the best way to simulate the time in between arrivals? And it turns out that, that rather than just picking an exponential because why not, yeah. you say, well, what's the least unbiased distribution of inter-arrivals? Turns out it's the exponential when you have these constraints. Because of that's right. Oh, that's right. So maximum entropy gives you the Poisson stuff. That's where we get Poisson point processes. It's from the maximum entropy. So already we're getting a nature. You know, a lot of people <clears throat> think of the Poisson process being nature inspired. A lot of people use Poisson processes to model nature. So I do some hydrology work, and we use Poisson point processes to model where rain is going to fall and things like that. And um, so it almost seems like we're, but we don't realize we get it from what was originally, you know nature inspired, trying to understand how particles settle out in the material. Now, the reason I'm even going through all of this is that this ugly partition function we're going to see ends up disappearing because of this so-called metropolis algorithm. And those of you, and we'll get to it for those of you who haven't, those of you who've used MCMC know that one of the powers of MCMC is you don't actually need to know the distribution, you just need to know what it's proportional to because it doesn't matter, the normalization stuff just gets canceled out. And so it, that's part of the reason, uh, you know, why the, the physicists have this partition function, because it's actually kind of the thing that they just don't really care that much about. It needs to be there if I need to say, well, what is the distribution? Well, I gotta do the normalization, but it turns out that all you really care is the numerator, and, and we'll see how that comes out to play and how that's used in simulating annealing here shortly. All right. So that's kind of background of, uh, now remember our original problem here is how to calculate the expected, um, say any expectations. So I've got some function f, which is uh, just a, a function of interest, of uh, material science interest. And I want to know what is the expected value of that thing if I integrate over all states of that function and I could say d state. So I uh, so that's sort of the expectation under the distribution little f of the big function f. And so this is what I, a material scientist wants to know. On average, whatever, let's call this the temperature of the material, or I don't know, or let's call this, there's some property that they're interested in that is a, that, that comes from the microstates of the material. And we know the microstates of the material could be in a number of different positions. And we want to know over all the positions the microstate of the material would be in. Each one of them corresponds to a particular value of my function big F. And so what's the average value of big F that will come out given that I pick the material up and I measure big F at this instant of time? That's what we're trying to solve. And, um, and this is too difficult a problem for normal numerical methods because the microstates of a chair are just too numerous. So you know, normal numerical methods would end up taking an area underneath the curve. So you'd have like this giant multi-dimensional space 
of potential uh, configurations that the molecules of a chair could be in. And for each one of them, uh, they would have a probability density and then they would have a corresponding big F. And I might take the area underneath that. And so this is too complicated to calculate by fully enumerating the space. And so an alternative is Monte Carlo sampling. And so the idea here is that I draw a random state uniformly, evaluate F of that state, um, and then repeat, say, M times. sum across F realizations and divide by M. And it just so happens that uh, if M is large enough, this will be a good estimate of that expectation. But the problem is um, if there are a lot of states, then this each one of these densities per state is going to be really, really small. And so typically, um, this uh, requires large M because most F state are very small. In other words, if I do this uniform sampling of microstates, you know, it's like if I was doing Monte Carlo sampling of this room, like I want to know some property of all the particles in this room, and one of the microstates is all the particles are up there in the corner. Well, that's extremely rare. But uniformly, if I just draw across microstates, I might happen to hit that one. And I'm going to hit a bunch of these that happen almost never. And those are basically wasted samples because they're not going to contribute to this sum. So I'm going to have to sample a whole lot in order to accumulate enough uh, realizations of this F in order to have low enough variance to really be confident in that estimate. Is there a question over there about a platform? I have a question. Yeah. Even if the thing has like a heavy uh, average? Yes, right. So this is a sample average. And so this is the idea of, so we call it Monte Carlo sampling, is that we are drawing random realizations of our function big F, and then we're taking the sample average of those. And I'm saying that the sample average can't be trusted um, in this case because our samples come from a uniform distribution. And so if we do 100 uniformly distributed samples and then another 100 uniformly distributed samples, we don't really converge on an agreement for what this sample average is until we get a huge number of samples because so many of our samples are wasted because they're in microstates that happen with probability density that's close to zero. So ideally, we would like to not sample this way. And so we're getting closer and closer to the insights that Metropolis had when, because initially this is what Metropolis wanted to do. Like, I think he was a grad student and uh, uh, I think he was a computational grad student and, um, and some chemists came to him and they said, we want to do this. And he said, all right, the, the quick and dirty way to do that would just do this Monte Carlo sampling. And then he realized that the probability densities are going to be so small in most of the samples that it was just going to take forever. And so they wanted to come up with a way to bias the sampling process so that every sample was useful. And that's how we got to Monte Carlo sampling, or later towards something called important sampling. If you take a more advanced class in like simulation, then you'll learn about important sampling, which is what Mon uh, Metropolis, uh, uh, Metropolis Hastings algorithm sort of became over time. So how do we, you know, what's an alternative? So alternative to uniform sampling. And the alternative is, well, what if I sample from F, from my little f, microstates, as opposed 
the sampling from the uniform distribution. So um, don't sample uniformly across microstates. Instead, sample from little f distribution. So this is the real distribution of microstates. And if we do that, then basically um, we we don't every so in the we don't have to do any rescaling or anything. We basically take um, whatever those samples are, <clears throat> add them all up, divide by, you basically take the sample average. And so this approach, the sample average, is close to the expected value of big F with far fewer samples. So if I have a, an ability to draw samples from the Boltzmann distribution, then I can estimate material science properties quicker than otherwise. Like the way the, the old school way of doing it, the this way of doing it, would be that I have to um, sample uniformly across all microstates, even if they're very, very unlikely add all those up together and get an estimate. And it would take me a huge number of samples. Here, um, I can actually um, sample, if I can sample from the Boltzmann distribution, this sample average will give me a very good estimate of this with few samples. And so that's what we really want to do, is figure out a way to sample from the Boltzmann distribution. So, but then the question in 1953 is how the heck do I draw samples that are from the Boltzmann distribution. I know how to draw samples uniformly. I've got this, <clears throat> this mean squared random number generator that does an okay job of drawing numbers uniformly. So how the heck do I turn that into samples from an exponential, samples from the Boltzmann distribution over an extremely high dimensional space? So that's how we want to do it. And so um, the, <clears throat> the broader class, and this is sort of an aside, but what this ends up becoming, you know, closer to now, is something called important sampling. And in important sampling, the idea is that if I want to take, let's say, um, the integral of f of x dx, that is approximately equal to the sum and actually I don't know why I've got that second sum so I'm going to do f of x p of x um, if which is some other distribution has same support as f. So in other words, if I want to take the area underneath a function, or hopefully a probability density, but it really doesn't matter, any function, um, I actually can draw samples from some other distribution and I can scale my samples by a so-called likelihood ratio and in order to bring them back. So I don't, uh, so like in this case, I actually just want to sample from the Boltzmann, but it turns out that, that let's say I wanted to just sample uh, from the Boltzmann, but I was, I, it was much easier for me to draw samples from some other distribution that's non-uniform. I could draw this, I, this tells me the important sampling provides me a way to map any sampling distribution to an integral under, under any other sampling distribution, just so long as my two sampling distributions are, have the same support. They're defined over the same outcomes. And so I'm not going to go into you know, detail here, and I think I botched actually something that should be here, uh, but, uh, but this idea of important sampling is just this broad idea that you can 
don't have to, you can choose whatever distribution you want to sample from, just so long as you know how to weight the outcomes later, and you can turn them into integrals under other distributions. And that's what came out of Metropolis Hastings years afterwards. Initially, they just wanted to figure out how to sample from the bulk stuff. Okay, so um, where we'll end up uh, going from this, and then we'll end up turning into the simulated annealing, is, uh, so the question then is how to draw from the Boltzmann for the exponential. Now those of you, you know, who've taken a numerical methods or a simulation course know that if the exponential is only defined over like one dimension, then there's this like, you know, you can draw a uniform random number and you take it to the natural log of it and you get the, the exponential. But we're talking about over a huge, a high dimensional space. And so this, this Boltzmann distribution is an exponential of energy states where the energy states uh, are as a macroscopic variable defined over an extremely high dimensional distribution, which is why this is a hard problem. And where, and so the Metropolis algorithm, which was later generalized in 1970 to the so-called Metropolis Hastings algorithm basically goes as follows. Choose a random particle configuration. So this is uniformly. And then I move them by a random displacement. So you can imagine that I pick some particle configuration and I added a little bit of noise, like zero mean Gaussian noise, just move them a little bit. And then I compare the energy levels from one to two. And I say, if now at lower energy, except move and then from there um, I either produce so I produce the sample from you know from number two and then I can um, repeat number two or n then you can say otherwise um, well maybe this isn't four but I'll say Otherwise, except with probability EXP, whatever the delta energy is, divided by KT. And so this delta E, it comes from that uh, Remember I said the Boltzmann distribution is an exponential divided by a partition function. Well, this likelihood ratio is basically going to be is taking the energy at one configuration divided by the energy at another configuration. The two partition functions cancel out, and then because there's exponentials on top and bottom, then they end up combining into just a delta. So this is what we'll later call a likelihood ratio, but for now you can just think of it as an exponential weighting like a fitness sharing idea or a fitness scaling idea, an exponential scaling of the difference in energy. So this idea is that I have chosen, I was at one energy level, and I chose an energy level that was a little higher. Now, because it's a little higher, I basically say, am I going to move to that higher energy level? And if this was gonna say that if it's a lot higher, then I'm not gonna do it. If it's just a little higher, I'm probably gonna do it. And, um, and if it's uh, zero or less, I'm definitely gonna do it. So that's what they're sort of saying here. And, um, and so then after I accept it, then I produce the sample. And that's either gonna be the sample, the original or the new, depending on the outcome of that. And then I can repeat uh, number two. 
And so the um, basic idea here is that I'm gonna start randomly, I'm gonna do kind of a local search. I move a little bit, I decide whether I accept. Uh, if I accept it, then I move a little bit more. If I, uh, it's at a higher energy level, it's a little harder to decide how to accept, but if I accept it, I produce it. Um, otherwise, I produce the old sample or keep the old sample.